Good morning, Branches Church. Happy Sunday. Those of you that made it into the room, good morning. It's good to see your guys' faces. And if you're making your way in, please do make your way in. We're going to stand. Let's sing. Let's worship together. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get started here, okay? God, thank you for this morning. God, we just, we love you so much, and we just completely offer this morning up to you, fully trusting you, God, to move, to work miracles in this place. Fill us with joy, fill us with excitement, God. Give our voices everything that we need so that we can fully praise you this morning. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.
lift that up. Sing it out. as you are here with us right now, that our hearts would be aware of that. That we would invite you in to lead us into a deeper devotion with you as we open up your word together, as we continue to worship you and praise you and thank you for who you are, God, and all of the gifts that you have given us. Lord, would that increase our faith, increase our desire to worship you, to give our whole self to you, Jesus. Because you are good. You are God. You have saved us, Jesus. Lord, bring us to that place daily, but today, God, before you, at your feet. God, as we exalt you, and lift you higher and higher and higher, place you higher and higher in our lives and in our heart, Jesus. Let that shape who we are and how we live. We love you, and we give all of this to you in your name. Amen. 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 What a wonderful morning it is. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Branches. We're so glad that you are here. My name is Katie. I'm one of the worship pastors here. And hey, there's a lot of new faces in here. A lot of old faces too, but new faces. Would you turn to someone next to you and introduce yourself, someone that you haven't met before, and we'll continue in a bit.
morning, Branches Church. Good morning, good morning. Can we just thank the worship team again for blessing us this morning? There was more fellowship going on this service than 8.30 for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, I shared with uh, the first service today that I, I was kind of reminiscing on the way in. And I, and I told him, I'm not sure as you get older, you reminisce more. And I thought, of, maybe you have more time to reminisce. I'm not sure what it is. but And I was recalling... Um, just those times where my wife Carrie and I, we had two boys when they were young. What it took to get to church sometimes. And um, some of you probably experienced that today. And it, it's interesting if it's not children, which, you know, it just it can be busy to get, get them to church. If it's not children, there's just life, right? We just, life is busy and life be messy and hectic, and um, I just want to encourage everyone today, if, if that was kind of your experience this morning, um, just take a deep spiritual breath right now. You made it. You're here. Um, and, and just allow God's Spirit to just really refresh you during the service today. Um, my name is Kevin Karka. I am I'm one of the elders here at Branches, and we're now going to transition from uh, worshiping the Lord um, in song to worshiping the Lord uh, in giving. And uh, we want to welcome anyone that's uh, here for the first time today. And what we always want to encourage folks is, if this is your first time, don't feel obligated to give as the baskets passed around. Um, we're just very thankful that you're here. So before we... Uh, pray for the giving. I want to just share a verse in uh, James 1, a couple verses, verse 16 and 17. It says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Let's pray. Father, we want to acknowledge you right now as the giver of all good gifts. Lord, we know they come from you. And Father, we pray that we might be um, good stewards of the gifts that you provide to us. We ask for wisdom. We ask for discernment with those gifts, Father. We also want to pray for those here at branches that are responsible for how those gifts are distributed and used, Lord. We ask that you give those men and discernment and wisdom as well. So we thank you for this day. We want to commit the rest of this service to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a look at the screens for some announcements. Welcome to Branches. I'm Andrew Shea. I'm here with a couple of announcements for families and items related to our family's ministry. Let me start by addressing families with young children. We're so glad that you're here. Despite all the pressures on your schedule and the stresses that come with raising little ones, you choose to gather as the church. We consider the massive amount of young families at our church community such a blessing. But we also recognize, given the limitations of a rented facility, that there can be some unintended disruptions to our weekend gatherings because of the noise these wonderful little people make. To help accommodate you and others, we created a brand new space during our service for you to move into the lobby when you need to, where we now have not only audio of the service going on, but also a screen that you can watch. If your child starts to become noisy or chatty, we kindly ask that you respect the experience of others in the gathering and move into that space. I know it's difficult to leave the gathering as my wife was forced to when our extra rambunctious youngest son started causing a scene as he often did, but we think this new space will help provide a means for you to stay engaged. Now as a parent myself, I know that when my child begins to cry, first I try the bottle, then I try the toy, then I try the pats, then I try the shushes, 
And sometimes it works and we're all good and sometimes it doesn't. I'd ask that as soon as your child starts to fuss, would you please move into that additional space? And for the rest of us, let's have some grace for the unexpected. This is a church that welcomes families and should be celebrating their presence among us. The time it takes for a noisy little one to move from this space to that one can feel like five minutes, but in actuality, it's much shorter. And sometimes there's some dominoes and one kid goes and then another and then another. We need grace, grace, grace. Let's all just do everything we can to accommodate and maximize the experience of everyone in this community. That's what we're modeling by opening up this additional space. I want to also mention that we have also created a private space for the nursing mothers that is open during both services. It's just one more way we want to try to acknowledge the needs of those who are here. And on that topic, we have some needs with volunteers. I know I'm talking about this every two to three months, but for good reason. During the summer right now, we understandably have volunteers on vacation and taking breaks, but with 150 kids showing up every Sunday, even in the summer, we have the room, but we don't have enough hands and help. We really require more volunteers. I want to remind you that as a church community, kids or no kids, we have a massive shared responsibility to raise up this next generation that's here. Maybe you have no idea, but there are churches that just dream of having 10 kids, let alone the 200 associated with branches. This is such a blessing that comes with the responsibility we have to steward together. And your contributions make a difference not only in the lives of these young ones, including my own, but as a community, we have to recognize that as much as what happens on stage impacts those who are visiting, many times it's the volunteers, it's you, and the experience of a child in the ministry that ultimately determines whether a person finds community here at Branches. So really, honestly, I want to encourage you to sign up. And if your child is newer in the ministry, and you are too here, I want to encourage you to take your first step toward being community with us by serving alongside us in the family ministry. You can serve once a month. That's right, you heard it once a month. And if enough step in, enough of you, enough of us, that alone would be such a game changer for us, just that once a month, especially as we look to the fall and the numbers that are going to be even higher. Okay, having said all that, I want to kick it over to Lisa for some exciting more announcements. Hi church, I'm Lisa Bryan and I'm the mission and women's pastor here at Branches with an invitation for our women. On Saturday, July 27th, we're hosting a Women's Beach Day from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in Newport Beach, meeting in Orange Street. This is a low-key gathering at the beach to meet new friends and connect with current friends. Lori Bradley will be also be sharing a short devotional with us, but otherwise, the day will be unprogrammed. Kids are welcomed, and if you are newer to our community, please join us so you can meet some new friends. You can find location details on our website, but there's no need to register. Next up, we're also hosting a workshop on Monday, July 22nd at 6.30 p.m. at our warehouse. We'll be discussing the origin of the Sabbath, hearing testimonies about people's experience with the Sabbath, and learning ways to practice the Sabbath today. If you've never heard the word Sabbath, or it sounds like an ancient, irrelevant practice, I encourage you to come check out this workshop and learn about God's value for rest and how to incorporate it into our busy modern lives because it's so needed. Heads up parents, we have free childcare available with registration at brancheshb.com. All right, that's it for announcements this morning. Please join me in welcoming up Andrew as he continues our series in 1 Corinthians. Thank you very much, everybody. I want to start with a little serious tone this morning that, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge we were a couple inches away from waking up to a very different world today. Of course, I'm referring to the attempted assassination of our former president, Donald Trump. And, you know, some people are waking up to a different world this morning because there was actually someone who perished at this political rally. And I know a lot's going to be talked about on this topic. We're going to hear a lot about who's to blame and what were the factors. I think it's a 20-year-old that committed this crime. We're going to talk about mental health and the state of mental health in this country. But... When I reflect on this, I really think that this is a manifestation of a murderous attitude that we've allowed characterize this nation. And I've seen this murderous, hateful attitude 
on display through a variety of different platforms. You know, Jesus said murder originates in the attitudes of the heart, the hatred of the heart. And we've allowed the media to become a place of just hateful rhetoric, murderous rhetoric. We've allowed our politicians all over to speak in ways that are hateful. And unfortunately, portions of the church have also gone along with this culture. And so everybody's going to be pointing fingers, but I think we really need to do an inventory of ourselves, particularly in the church, because we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be salt and light in this culture. We're supposed to be a city on a hill that can't be hidden, that's showing what the community of God looks like to the rest of this nation. We have a Lord and Master who commanded that we love our enemies. So we have to find a way to hold our views of politics and policy in a way that still expresses dignity to all human beings. Because, I'm, yeah, I mean, you can say amen to that. But I'm grieved, you know. I'm disappointed in the culture that I've seen develop as I've developed into adulthood. This is not the culture in my nation that I want to see reflected. This isn't the culture and murderous, hateful attitude that I want to pass on to my children as their inheritance. So we all have to take up our responsibility as the church to carve a different path. And hopefully, let me also affirm this simple, basic assertion that any dignified person, any decent person in America should be able to affirm, thank God Donald Trump was not assassinated yesterday. Amen? Every decent human being should be able to affirm that simple fact. All right, that's sermon number one. Let's move on to sermon number two, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you open there with me this morning? If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand, and one of the ushers will pass one to you. We're working through this book. We're pretty good amount of the way into it. Here we are in chapter 12. I love how practical this book is. I love how specific it is. I don't know if you can remember, all the way back in January, we started this study, and we're talking about things through this study, like how we're supposed to use our bodies. You know, what's the proper sexual ethic? We talked a couple weeks ago about our dress, what we wear, and what that communicates. Last week, we talked about the Lord's Supper. What's the proper way to go about observing the Lord's Supper? Very practical theology in 1 Corinthians. I love it. It's like the home economics course for Christianity. I was not blessed with a home economics course in my public high school education, I learned how to do calculus. I learned chemistry, but I did not learn how to cook an egg or do my laundry by the time I got to college, right? What did I learn? I didn't learn the practicals. This is the practicals. This is the home economics course for the church, and one of its lengthiest treatments regarding Christian practice is related to the spiritual gifts the gifts of the Spirit and how they are supposed to function and what place they play in the gathering of God's people. We're going to begin that discussion this morning. It's going to go on for several weeks, several chapters of this book, but let's begin it together today as we kind of get the overall picture of their purpose and some distinctives about them. Let's read chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now to each one... The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. There you go. Let's pause there this morning. As I said, this is a bit of an introduction into a multi-week study. 
into the nature of spiritual gifts. So it's appropriate that Paul starts out in verse 1 by introducing it as such. He says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, now concerning the gifts of the Spirit, I do not want you to be uninformed. And I love this because, you know, there are some topics I want to remain uninformed. I don't want to know how hot dogs are made. I want to remain uninformed. I would like to continue enjoying them without my conscience being harmed. I would like to remain ignorant about that. But when it comes to spiritual matters, you know, I want to be informed. I want to learn. And we have the Word of God to learn from. That's why we open it here every week and we read it. Because there are answers for our questions. There are guardrails for our practices. There is a way to measure if what we are experiencing goes along with what God says we should be experiencing and what is actually maturity. I'm not here to give you some invented, hyped up, pseudo-inspirational talk on spiritual gifts based on what I think. Who cares? Let's hear what God thinks. Surely God knows what is most spiritual. He can speak for himself from his word. Now there's room for us to see some of the specifics differently. But I want to suggest there are some cultures of the church today that choose to remain willfully ignorant in some of the things that are very black and white and laid out in the next couple of chapters. Let's be the sort of church that pursues understanding in all things, who pursues being informed, in this case regarding the spiritual gifts. And let's allow what we read to form and reform our values and practices instead of just relying on the tradition we came from and the way we've always done it and what we already knew. But before we get any further, I think I've got to answer this question. What are the gifts of the Spirit, the spiritual gifts? For reference, when I refer to the spiritual gifts, I want to clarify we're talking about the diverse roles and functions that the believers play in the community of God that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Like me preaching right now. This is considered a gift, a grace. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, let me be the judge of that, whether this is really going to be a gift or not. I'll tell you at the end. But in general, what I'm trying to say is uh, to preach, to teach, uh, to prophesy, that is a gift. It's a grace that's from God, worked through me for your benefit, ideally for your benefit. We'll get into more specifics on that in a few moments as Paul begins to define some of the gifts and their nature later in this text. But before we get there, Paul wants the Corinthians to sober up regarding this topic. He wants them to be humble as they approach it. Because when we talk about the gifts, we are necessarily talking about something we're going to experience. Like I'm, you know, sharing this gift of preaching right now, and you are in this experience. Anytime we're talking about the spiritual gifts, they're going to be something that we ourselves are experiencing. So Paul wants to engender some humility in the Corinthians because they have not been the greatest judge of what is actually spiritual in their experience of the past. So he says in verse 2 this, You know that when you were pagans, before you were Christian, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. So you guys get what he's saying here? He's bringing up their spiritual experience track record. And he's showing that they have had a capacity, they've demonstrated a capacity to fabricate and embrace false spiritual experiences. It's like, guys, before we talk finances... I just want to remind you, you have five bankruptcies on your record. Before we talk about your next marriage you're really excited about, let's talk about the three divorces you've already had. Spiritually speaking, Paul's going, you guys are a terrible judge of what is actually of God, of what is actually genuine. You see, the idols that they used to worship were fabricated by human beings. They were objects of wood and stone. And somehow or other... These Corinthians were spiritually duped into believing these ancient objects were endowed with power and authority, and it's likely that they felt things and they saw things as they were going about their exuberant or ecstatic worship before them. So Paul is warning them to start, and he's warning us by extension that we human beings still have this innate capacity to fabricate spiritual experiences and to experience as real things that are false or at best just not all that helpful for our actual growth in Jesus. 
So how do we know if what we're experiencing is real? How do we know if our experiences are genuinely of God? In verse 3, Paul gives us a healthy rule of thumb. He says, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So that's it. It just has to have the Jesus stamp on it, and that's like the certificate of authenticity for spiritual experiences. Just stamp it with Jesus. Does that mean we should all quickly run to our phones and computers and bring a contribution to that $45 million campaign for that pastor's private jet because it's being done for Jesus? Right? It's got the Jesus stamp. It must be of the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Please don't do that. Let me clarify that Paul's not suggesting anyone who simply mimics this confession Well, that makes them genuine or authentic as representing God. But that the genuine practice of the gifts serves the purpose of exalting Christ every time. And they find their origin in the real activity of the Spirit of God. And so that's the first conclusion I want us to take to heart, to take note of this morning as we're talking about the nature of spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts exalt Jesus. That is their purpose. The spiritual gifts and the exercise of them exalt Jesus. So if it originates in people, and it comes from people's behavior and preferences, and it ends up exalting people, or otherwise lacks conformity to the confession of Christ, it ain't spiritual, guys, even if it feels spiritual, because it isn't from the Holy Spirit. Now that's going to look like a lot of different things in practice. And that's what Paul suggests in verses 4 to 6. Let's read it again. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So that's our second conclusion related to the nature of spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are diverse, meaning God works in a variety of ways through different people and their various personalities and strengths and so on. Now, don't be discouraged If you didn't find yourself, if you couldn't identify yourself in the list that I read here from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, don't think of yourself like, you know, that vertically challenged kid who says, well, guess I can't play basketball. You know, I I guess I'm just not tall enough. I didn't get the genes. I can't play the game. Like, some of you could look at the list and say, wait, I don't belong here. Guess I don't have anything to contribute. Guys, this list in 1 Corinthians 12, it's just a survey. It's not all-inclusive. There are other lists in different letters that other people received with gifts that are listed that aren't here like mercy and administration. But even as I say that, I think we as modern Christians have just gotten so narrow and scientific with the way that we view this that we think, man, these are very specific terms that have to characterize me and, 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 and I have to fit into exactly just one of these categories. But again, Paul is just kind of talking like, hey, here are some ways God works and it's, it's diverse, there's variety. It's sort of like if I was to describe colors, I could speak in generalities. Like we have general categories of colors. We have red and yellow and blue and green. But did you know Sherwin-Williams has 1,700 paint colors? 1,700 paint colors. That's why you go, you want to paint something, you're just paralyzed when you look at all the swatches. I wanted a red. I didn't know there was a 1,000 types. Of, there's a 100 whites in Sherwin-Williams. How could you possibly have a 100 versions of white? Now think about it. There's not just these, you know, simplified blue and green and yellow and red. Did you guys know that there's real red? There's red barn? There's Rockwood dark red. Ooh, there's positive red. I'm very curious about that one. I thought only red was negative all the time, but there's a positive red. Guys, not every gift expresses itself the same way through every believer. The point is there's a whole gradient, a whole spectrum of diverse contributions that God brings through believers. Now, another thing that we learn from these three verses is that all the spiritual gifts are distributed and empowered by the Spirit of God. So take note of that. The spiritual gifts originate in God. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, well, duh, Andrew. (laughs) Like, oh, cool, spiritual gifts, they originate in God. This is such a gift of a message. You're right. Wow, we've been so graced by your teaching. But, But I don't want us to miss the significance of this because I believe for thousands of years, Christian culture has missed the significance of this. 
that the spiritual gifts originate in God. I mean, I don't know if you remember all the way back in January as we began the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul was giving credit for all spiritual insight that exists in the people of God. He was giving credit to the Holy Spirit so that the community wouldn't hear someone who's got a lot of knowledge and a lot of ability in articulating all these various spiritual insights so they wouldn't prop them up on a platform, on a pedestal, and say, oh, wow, look how knowledgeable they are. He was going, look, if there's any insight in the people of God, it originates in God himself, and he gets the credit. So it's the same discussion when it comes to spiritual gifts. There's this worldly temptation to value someone or to give them a greater deal of prominence because of the works that they perform in front of other people. But he's saying, look, it's not them that's doing it. It's God that's doing it through them. It'd be like if there's a party that I couldn't attend. So you said, you know what? I'm going to give a contribution. I'm going to give a gift to that party because I can't be there. I'm going to cater in some world-class food. But I can't be there, so I have to have somebody deliver it for me. And they go to the party, and they deliver that meal. And everyone says, oh, my gosh, what a meal. What a contribution you have brought to this party. And they said, oh, yeah, I have brought a really great contribution. And they just begin to soak up all of that acclaim and credit, even though it didn't start with them. I'm the one behind all of it. I'm the one who actually gave the gift. I'm the one who made it happen. So just because someone has a visible role as, let's say, a preacher, because I am one, That doesn't mean we should consider them more valuable or more inherently spiritual than anyone else. That's God at work through what they accomplish. And we also shouldn't discount the less visible work or exercise of a gift like helps because it's the same Holy Spirit empowering that person in that work of helping. Now, as far as I can tell, stepping onto this Christianity train 2,000 years into its journey, we have done a bang-up job of totally ignoring this teaching right here. And what we're about to see in the next passage regarding the parts of the body, he says the presentable parts of the body don't need any special honor because they already are honored. It's the unpresentable parts of the body, the hidden parts of the body, they need the special honor. You're going to get there next week. But we have absolutely, unquestionably amplified those who exercise more public gifts and totally undermine the spiritual value of things like the gift of service, even though Jesus himself said it's akin to greatness in the kingdom of God. And I feel like the Spirit of God just rolls his eyes over all of it. Because he's like, guys, at the end of the day, it's all me. It's all me. You see, the gifts are not about the amplification of certain personalities. They're for the amplification of Jesus' lordship, as we concluded earlier. And that's achieved through the benefit that they bring toward what Paul refers to in verse 7 as the common good, the common profiting that occurs in the community of God. So that's another note I want you to make regarding the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are for the benefit of the community of God. That's how they exalt Jesus. Now this is a theme that is going to reemerge several times. Take note of this because you're going to see it come up again and again as we work through the next couple chapters, that this is the primary work of the Holy Spirit and the gathering of his people. It's not to entertain us. It's not just to make us feel all warm and fuzzy, right? It's not for us to become the best version of us on our own terms. He is most active. He's most on display as we build each other up and serve and strengthen each other. That's the criteria of the Holy Spirit at work as we contribute and build and strengthen each other. Now, some people will say, man, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. People will refer to, oh, this is a thin place. This is a place, this is a time, a space where the line between heaven and earth, it's really thin. Like we're almost there. I can sense it. I can feel it. Now, does anyone like help someone in the church move into a new house and they're lifting a refrigerator up several flights of stairs and they declare, this is a thin place. Where the line between heaven and earth, man, I can't even tell the difference. I just feel the Holy Spirit right now. No, when I'm moving a refrigerator up several flights of stairs, I call that a thick place. Where the line between heaven and earth is very distinct. 
where I've never felt further from heaven at all in terms of my own experience. But that's where we're exercising real love. That's where we're contributing for the benefit of the community of God. People say, oh, heaven is breaking through right now. Has anyone declared that as they sat there and typed in their bank account information and gave a significant contribution to a ministry? Oh, there we go. Heaven breaking through. No, you're more likely to feel like you're breaking down when you do something like that, right? Because it's actually sacrificial. No, we like to characterize times of emotional ecstasy in worship as those times where we're in that thin place where heaven is breaking through. That's the thin place. But guys, do you understand? People can feel those things worshiping mute idols. You can drum up all those same feelings. They used to do it in front of a statue of wood or stone. You can travel to a thin place anytime you want if you take meth. That's a very thin place where you're not sure if you're on the earth or you're in heaven. I don't recommend it. Emotions absolutely have their place in our spirituality. Absolutely. I'm not writing off our emotions. And they're going to have a place, and that's going to be clarified in the next couple chapters. But I want you to know that where and how the Spirit works, we can identify it by locating wherever the common good is being pursued by God's diverse people in the effort to exalt Jesus' lordship. Now, starting in verse 8, Paul begins to color in some of what he's outlined regarding the spiritual gifts. He's going to get a little specific. He's going to give us a little bit of a survey of some of the gifts. And I'm going to be a little teachy here for a few moments. We don't have much time, so I'm going to go rather quickly. We're going to taste a little bit of this sampler of the various gifts. And there in verse 8, we can see how generally descriptive and imprecise even this sampler is. For Paul says, to one is given a message of wisdom and to another a message of knowledge. Again, I want to suggest that when it comes to the spiritual gifts, we shouldn't be overly fixated on the ways these functions are described. And I understand why we would want to. We like to identify ourselves in them. Oh, that's mine. And we like to wear them like badges of honor, and they help us understand who we are. It's like personality tests. It's like people with titles and degrees. You know, if you get their title wrong or you get their degree wrong, they correct you. They're like, oh, wait, no, 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 no. I am the da 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 of this, Right? It's because it's a reflection of who they are, right? They've bound themselves to it. But Paul's simply saying, guys, there's different ways that God gives insight to people, wisdom, knowledge, and that insight is going to be shared for the benefit of other people. It's not about the specific terms. In Greek, the term wisdom, it refers to more like broad knowledge. It's the word sophia. That's where we get the word philosophy from. It's more broad knowledge. The word knowledge in the Greek deals more with like specific, hands-on, experiential knowledge. Paul's going, some have this sort of understanding, some have that. And they're provided for the benefit of others in the church. Moving on. Paul lists faith as a gift in verse 9. And indeed, all faith finds its source in God as a gift to us. But I believe Paul is saying there are just some people blessed with an extra amount of resiliency in their faith. Like when hardship comes, challenges come, setbacks, the unknown they're just more apt to trust God. They're the guy that's like, they're the girl that's like, man, this is happening, but I just think God's going to do something. And you're like, on what basis, right? (laughs) I don't see anything here to recommend that. And they're like, I just have faith. I just have faith. And that can be really frustrating for us sometimes, but but it really does raise the bar for the rest of us. In our faith, when someone says, you know what, I think, I think there's a blessing on the other side of this that's unclear at this point. It's, I don't know if you've ever coached a team or you've watched a sports team and there's somebody who just has a positive attitude and they raise the entire attitude of the entire roster. That's what people gifted in faith do for our faith in the community of God. Paul then cites the gifts of healing and miracles. I think these overlap to a certain degree, like knowledge and wisdom, and yet there are differences. Like when it comes to the gift of healing, I've come to understand that there are those who are gifted to help heal people emotionally, therapists. There are those who are doctors who understand the body, right? There are those who have a healing touch that are physical therapists. And there are those who pray and miraculous things happen. The blind can see and the lame begin to walk. Prophecy is listed in verse 10, and it's an important one for the purposes of 1 Corinthians because that gift is going to play a prominent role in the next couple chapters. 
Some think of prophecy as sort of exclusively this ecstatic foretelling of the future. And yes, we see that demonstrated in the book of Acts, where people predict future events accurately for individuals or for the nation or the world by the revelation of God. That's valid. But broadly speaking, the Bible is prophecy because it's the forth telling, not just the foretelling, but the forth telling of the words of God. And if you look at the ministry and role of the prophets predominantly through the history of God's people, more commonly, it's akin to the act of declaring God's directives in God's voice and authority in a particular place and time. I think preaching can be an expression of prophecy because the preacher is not merely expounding upon some ideas or concepts, but we're speaking to the innermost motivations of the heart, calling out sin calling forth repentance and obedience to God's directive. That was the role of prophets through the history of God's people, and it was a gift continuing to be exercised in the Corinthian church by both men and women for the common good. Now in verse 10, Paul includes the gift of discerning spirits. It's an interesting sounding one to say the least. You're like, ooh, what's that? But this phrase merely refers to weighing and testing teaching and prophecy by someone who has this particular insight and intuition regarding what is taking place beyond the superficial. One with this gift has a particular sense, guided by the Holy Spirit, as they test the motives, as they test the manner in which something is being done. Is that actually of God, or is it not of God? And then lastly, we have the Corinthians' favorite and most prized and valued of the gifts, as we'll see in the coming weeks, the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. The word in the Greek simply means other languages. And we see this gift on display in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit descends upon the church. It's the day of Pentecost. And the believers are speaking in other tongues, other languages. And there are people all from the region, different places that are gathered for this festival of Pentecost. And they're hearing the works of God in their own native languages. So the gift of tongues can be speaking other literal foreign languages that you could not otherwise speak as empowered by the Holy Spirit. But in this case, I'm inclined to believe that this refers to the practice of ecstatic speech, speaking in ways that are unintelligible to the average person, but in some way able to be interpreted by somebody gifted in the Holy Spirit to do so. We're going to talk a lot more about the fascinating nature of this spiritual gift and its place in the spiritual life of the people of God, but we'll just leave it at that definition for now, because that's going to take a lot of time. We'll get there. As I said, this list is not all-inclusive. This is Paul laying out a little charcuterie board. He's giving us a little taste. He's giving us a little sampler. He's setting the table for the various ways God can work through the diverse people of God. But the final line is what he wants us to grasp through this presentation. Verse 11, all these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Meaning God works in all the various ways I described, That's something I stated before. The Holy Spirit's and every single one of these activities is spiritual because he's at work in them. They're all supernatural. But the assumption is that every single last person in here has received at least one. That's an important take-home point. Take that note. The spiritual gifts are given to all believers. We are all uniquely endowed with services and works to perform for the benefit of others and ultimately to exalt the lordship of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have at least one gift of the Holy Spirit that you are called to contribute to the people of God. No one is excluded. Now, a couple takeaways before we leave. How do we summarize this? What should we think as we go our separate ways? Let me say this. If it's done for the common good of believers and exalts Christ, it's spiritual. That's a good rule of thumb. If it's done for the common good of believers and it exalts Christ, it's spiritual. What we feel does not determine what is spiritual. There are lots of things that feel spiritual that are just fabricated in the weakness of the human psyche and body. That is not always a good indicator of what is actually of God. If you want to know if something involves the spirit or not, is it done for the common good of believers? And does it exalt Jesus? Well, that's a really good place to start. That's a really good place to start to figure out if the Holy Spirit is at work. Number two, we should not associate the value of a person with the gifts 
they exercise. I'm going to say that again. We should not associate the value of a person with the gifts they exercise. I'm going to say it again. We should not associate the value of a person with the gifts they exercise. The reason I have to say that three times is because we have absolutely neglected the value of that teaching. It's God that does the work, and he's at work in every single person. God doesn't do meaningless work through certain people. He does meaningful work through every single one of his people. Now, we're going to learn there are some gifts that have a more prominent place in the gathering of believers because of the effect that they have on the congregation, on the gathering. But that does not mean that the individuals that exercise those gifts should be given a place of prominence among the people of God just because they exercise those gifts. That's what next week is really going to drive home. Finally, and I really want you to take this to heart, it is less for us to discover our specific gifts than it is for us to simply contribute. Now, I'm not telling you don't go online and try to figure out, you know, what sort of gifts and words can describe what you bring. And I'm not saying you shouldn't grow in what you feel God has gifted you with and exercise those. I'm just saying it's become such an obsession that, look, just contribute. When you bring you the way God is forming you, you'll bring your gifts to the community of God. When we make it about what we are and what we've received, then it begins to kind of miss what the whole thing is about. It becomes about us. Guess what? We can't help but be what God has made us to be. When you begin to contribute, let's say you're a teacher. You've been gifted as a teacher. You begin to contribute, you're going to start to teach. I had a bunch of community group members. They weren't the community group leader. They weren't the preacher on the stage, but they were gifted as teachers. They come to community group, they start teaching. It's because it's what they do. It's what they're gifted to do. If you're an encourager and you begin to contribute, you're going to encourage. You're a healer, right? And you begin to contribute, you're going to begin to heal people and help heal people. If you're a servant, you're going to begin to serve, and so on. If you pray and miraculous things happen, if you contribute, you're going to start to pray, and miraculous things are going to happen. I'm telling you, we are better together. Just start contributing. That's the common good. Paul was talking about. That's the common profiting that should occur as we come together. The Greek word for that is sumphero. It's like symphonia, which is another Greek word from which we get the word symphony. Symphonia, it's two words, together and voices. That's what makes the symphony. Sumphero is two words. It's together and bringing or carrying with. So when we all bring it together, right, it's like Making music, it's like the orchestra. It's beautiful. We complement each other. We're made whole. In grade school, I learned to play the saxophone. The saxophone by itself is the most obnoxious of all the instruments. We got a saxophone player. I'm I'm one of you, all right? I can say that as one of you, okay? When it's put together with other instruments, it has its role. It has its place. But, I mean, just 12 saxophones just honking it out. Like, that's, that's how a saxophone sounds. It just, it's, it's not the ideal. We're not all supposed to be the same. We're not all supposed to have the same gifts. It wouldn't bring the benefit. It wouldn't be what it's supposed to be. The church is not supposed to be a solo act like it is in some cultures where the whole thing is built around one person's giftedness and one person's personality and no one else has anything to contribute, guess what? In service of that, we lose the exaltation of Christ. The diversity of sound and gifts and personalities contributing together, that's what makes a beautiful, effective, and powerful community. That's what the Lord wants from this branches community. And I'll tell you, the greatest obstacle that we have as a church in this mission that we have in this world that Jesus has given us is not anything out there. It's not anything we're going to face out there. It's what we lack in here. When there are some contributing and there are others who are sitting on their hands or hanging back or keeping others at arm's reach and not exercising what they have to contribute. That's what holds us back. we got people who want to step into community. We don't have community group leaders. 
You know why? Because no one wants to be accountable for being there every time you're supposed to be there. Anyone who attends a community group doesn't have to go. They can say, I don't want to be there. But the person who's accountable to lead the group, they're saying, I have to be there. And people are going, man, I don't know if I want to be responsible for that twice a month. And we lack because people won't open their home twice a month because of the commitments and all the busyness of Orange County and the fear of what it's going to do. We lack. There are enough adult Christians in the city of Huntington Beach to disciple every child in Huntington Beach, not just the children that are in church. I mean, we have enough Christians in our community to be able to disciple the kids that are in our own community. There's enough finances in the city of Huntington Beach to supply the needs of all the churches and all the ministries and not have anyone be in lack. There's more than enough for all of that to take place. That's why we're not jealous for the... You give the common ground. Give the young lives, right? There's enough resources in the city to supply the needs of branches and everybody else and have enough so that no one lacks. But we lack because not everybody's contributing. And so I want us to consider that as we pray together about this important passage and about our important role, every role important in the people of God here at Branches and in the body of Christ across Huntington Beach. Would you pray with me? And Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that there are so many that are contributing and there are so many that are offering their gifts. And it's taken place all across this morning. People who are welcoming and serving with hospitality. Those who are silently behind the scenes setting up the space before some of us were even awake. Those who are caring for our kids and will be all week long at VBS. Those who are opening up their homes regularly. Lord, the discipleship groups. The various ministry partners. Just had young wives go to camp. We've got the surf camp going on for Common Ground. There's so many who are contributing. And Lord, you've empowered them by your Holy Spirit. Every single one of those acts is supernatural because it's empowered by you. It's for your kingdom. I don't want to shortcut that. Lord, I don't want to shortcut what you're doing outside the bounds of an organization. When somebody in this community has someone else placed on their heart by you, God, and they reach out and they want to serve. They send that text message. They make themselves available to somebody else, Lord. That's your Holy Spirit at work. Those contributions are just as much a part of your kingdom. And that's happening here. And I'm so grateful for that, Lord. And I just pray those individuals would just be encouraged and deepen through this message. But Lord, we also know there's some of us, we are sitting on our hands. We are keeping others at arm's reach. We're not exercising the gifts that you've given us. We're not sharing what you place in our heart. Lord, would you prompt many in here this morning to say, I'm going to step in. Lord, there are some who are insecure. They don't know if they fit. They don't know if they fit in church. They don't know if you could use them. They think, oh, it has to be done on a platform. It has to be something that other people see. Lord, I pray you would encourage them. There isn't a single soul in this community that does not have you at work in their life. There's nobody in here that's excluded from your plans and purposes. Every single person has a vital role to play in your kingdom here in Huntington Beach. That is true, true, true. It is from your word. It's true. So speak it over every single person in this room. They all have much to contribute. And we lack. We don't benefit. We We lose some of that profit together when they're not present. I just want to invite you to spend the next couple moments just praying this through. And maybe the Lord just wants to confirm and affirm the contributions you're making in a ministry, outside the ministry, just in your life, how the Lord is at work in you. He may just want to say, you got it. And this is just more fuel to keep going. For others of us, maybe there's going to be a sense of conviction and the Lord's going to lead you to say, I got to step in in this place. I got to utilize this gifting that I know he's given me. Just spend some time in prayer.
enter into a time of singing and worship. Would you stand with me? This is like our purpose. We're, we're made to worship the Lord. This is a really valuable time for us. But I want you to consider that maybe the most spiritual thing you do today is to go to the connection table and sign up to contribute. It's when you go sit down at your computer and you enter your bank account information and you give a meaningful gift to a ministry. Meaningful not in terms of size, but in terms of cost to you. That could be small but big in God's kingdom. I'm just saying, those are the times where that's a thin place. Something practical like that, when you're bringing the common benefit to the community of God for the exaltation of Jesus. It could be when you're prompted to go check in on that person and make yourself available for their needs today. That's a thin place. That's heaven breaking through, even if people don't think of it that way. So let's sing these songs of worship, and let's ask the Lord to lead us to follow through in how he prompts our hearts.
extend your hands in a posture of receiving this blessing. I'm going to pray over us as a church family. Heavenly Father, we want to see you. and You've given us a way to make you visible to our brothers and sisters, and that's by contributing what you've gifted us in love. And that's how we see you so often too, Lord, is through the contributions of others. So Lord, we pray that we'd really be moved today, prompted by your Holy Spirit to live for the benefit of those who are around us so that we can exalt you, so that we can show you as you are. You're holy, you're set apart, you're different. That's our mission in front of this watching world is to show just how different and holy and other you are through our fellowship with one another. Help us to make that visible by the contributions that we give to one another. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.